Limit on Robert. But uh, let's not do that. Okay, are we recording? Um, are you recording? You are recording. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Maybe um, uh, you can pick that up after. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, just an announcement. I believe I've now handed back problems as one through seven. Uh, so if you haven't picked those up, I have them in a giant folder for you uh, here to pick up. Uh, problem set nine is due next Wednesday. That is the penultimate problem set. Um, the ultimate problem set will be handed out on Wednesday. Okay. So last class, we began discussing um, what is known as the wave particle nature of uh, matter. And in particular, what we saw is that electrons, uh, despite being frequently regarded as a particle, often behave like waves. And likewise, as we will discuss today, photons, which is to say light, sometimes behaves as a particle. So light, despite frequently being described as a wave, will often behave like a particle. Uh, and that particle, of course, is referred to as a photon. And this is despite the fact that in the classical description of light, we regard light as an electromagnetic wave. So it should obey all of the usual uh, properties that waves obey, such as superposition. You can take two electromagnetic waves and add them together to get a third. And interference, both uh, constructive and destructive, and so forth. But it was discovered in the first few decades of the 20th century that just as under certain peculiar circumstances, electrons behave like waves, under other interesting circumstances, uh, light will behave like a particle. And the two experiments that people typically talk about, which really made this clear, were the experiments of the photoelectric effect, which was first explained by Einstein in 1905, and that of Compton scattering. So the photoelectric effect is actually, uh, in modern terms, quite easy to understand. The observation was that if you shine light at a metal, then that metal, uh, that light will transmit energy to the metal. That metal will excite the electrons that are contained in the metal. And those electrons will fly off, and then we can observe, and then we observe them. And the interesting feature of the photoelectric effect is that if you take very, very low intensity light, then if light were a wave, you'd expect that you could shine this low intensity light on a metal, and gradually the metal would accumulate energy until eventually it gathered enough energy to liberate one of the electrons from the metal, and that electron would go flying off. But in fact, that is not what is observed. Instead, what is observed is that photons will liberate electrons from a metal only if they have certain quantized energies and in particular, only if they have sufficient energy. So you might think that if light were a wave, you could shine a very low intensity electromagnetic wave on a metal, and that metal would gr the electrons there would gradually accumulate energy. But in fact, that is not what occurs. Instead, what occurs is that you have to shine light with a sufficient intensity so that in order for it to liberate an electron. So that indicates that whatever process is going on where the light is liberating electrons from this metal, it must be a process where you have some sort of packet of energy or a quantum of energy contained in this light 
um, which is uh, indeed uh, uh, what we have later come to understand as a, a photon. I think um, Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect um, is one of these remarkable stories in physics. Um, within a period of one year in 1905, um, he published, I think, five papers, I think each one of which individually would have been deserving a of a Nobel Prize. Um, and they were on uh, very broadly different areas of physics. Uh, for example, he published uh, one on uh, space and time and special relativity, one on energy and momentum and special relativity, one on the photoelectric effect, one on Brownian motion, which essentially, uh, so the photoelectric effect described the quantization of photons. Uh, Brownian motion described uh, the random motion of atoms and essentially uh, uh, described the atomic nature of matter. Uh, and I forget what the fifth one is. I think it might have also been something related to Brownian motion. But I think um, there's a reason why Einstein is the guy who, who has his face on all of the t-shirts, you know, um, which is that I think that, um, you know, uh, the uh, number of, uh, you know, this is called the, the, the Annus Mirabilis, the miraculous year, um, because I think it was, um, you know, it, it, it was uh, uh, a lot of his work in that particular year, which fundamentally um, reconfigured uh, our way of thinking about uh, space, uh, time, and matter. Um, so the photoelectric effect is rather simple to explain. And it was really based on this that one can understand uh, that photons have an energy which is proportional to their frequency and a momentum which is also proportional to their frequency. And um, in fact, uh, this uh, is related to earlier uh, discussions of Planck who was the first person actually to propose that um, the energy uh, states of a photon or of electromagnetic waves were quantized in some way. Um, we probably, we may or may not have time to discuss Planck, uh, black body radiation and uh, Planck's uh, formula um, because it's actually something that's technically a bit more involved than the more simple things that I'll be discussing here. Um, but um, I think Einstein's great uh, contribution in his discussion of the photoelectric effect was to realize that the constant that Planck had described, Planck's constant, that arose in the quantization of radiation was also the same thing that would arise in the uh, description of the quantization of energy levels in the uh, photoelectric effect. Um, the other effect that I would like to describe, the other experiment that was done which really made clear the particulate nature of light uh, is known as Compton scattering. And uh, you actually know uh, Compton scattering, even though you don't. So how many people have seen Compton scattering before? You've actually all seen it before. It was one of the problems on your midterm. Okay. Uh, a simplified form of Compton scattering was, I think, uh, the hard problem on your midterm. Um, I would like to give a slightly more systematic treatment of it than you may have given, may or may not have given uh, uh, on your midterm. So in the process of Compton scattering, we consider the process of light scattering off of a electron. So for example, let's consider a photon with some momentum Q that is incident upon some electron. And then after the scattering process, the electron will fly off in some direction with some momentum P. And the photon will fly off in some other direction with the momentum Q prime at some angle theta relative to the horizontal axis where we take our photon to be moving purely horizontally before the scattering process takes place. And the Compton scattering experiment is uh, interesting because the result of this experiment really makes it clear that light should be regarded as a particle rather than a wave. So let's go ahead and just analyze this process using our usual uh, rules of relativistic 
kinematics. So the first rule that we must impose is the conser conservation of energy. So the conservation of energy states that the total energy before the scattering takes place, which is uh, the energy of the photon, h times its frequency, plus the energy of the electron, mc squared, because the electron is at rest, must equal the total energy afterwards, which is h f prime, where f prime is the frequency of the photon after the scattering process, plus the energy of the electron, which is given by the relativistic formula p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. So that's conservation of energy. And then conservation of momentum simply states that q, the momentum vector beforehand, is equal to p plus q prime so that p squared is q minus q prime squared. So p squared here being the square of the momentum vector. And we can then use the fact that the square of the momentum vector, so the length of the momentum vector is just, of course, hf over c, the total momentum vector times q hat. So q is the total momentum of the photon times q hat, which is the direction of the momentum of the photon. So plugging that in, this is q squared, oops, there's a prime there, plus q prime squared minus 2 q dot q prime. So that p squared is equal to hf over c squared plus hf prime over c squared minus twice q dot q prime, which is uh, hf over c times hf prime over c times q hat dot q hat prime. Uh, and what is the dot product of two unit vectors? Well, that's just the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So q hat points in the horizontal direction, and q hat prime points uh, in an angle which is not hor in a direction that is not horizontal and differs from the horizontal direction by an angle theta. So that dot product is just cosine theta. So we can take that formula for p squared and compare it to the one that we get from the conservation of energy. So from the conservation of energy, we can just move that hf prime over to the other side and square both sides of the equation. So p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth is equal to hf squared plus hf prime squared plus m squared c to the fourth plus a bunch of cross terms. So we'll have an h squared f f prime and an h f plus f prime times uh, m c squared with a factor of two there just from squaring uh, the sec this side of the equation when that hf prime is moved onto the left-hand side. Okay. So we can cancel these m squared c to the fourths and compare this equation coming from the conservation of energy with this equation coming from the conservation of uh, momentum. So you can just uh, divide this, equ this equation for the constant of energy, conservation of energy by c squared, and compare it to this equation here for p squared. And so you see that this term here cancels that term here, this term here cancels that term here, and you're left with the, an equation 
Oh, I'm sorry. There's a minus sign. Is that what you, there you go. There was a minus sign there. And we're left with the equation that minus 2 h squared f, f prime over c squared cosine theta is equal to 2h f minus f prime mc squared plus h squared f f prime divided by c squared. Oh, I'm sorry. Dividing by c squared there. So if I did this all correctly, f minus f prime is equal to h times f f prime divided by mc squared times 1 minus cosine theta. Did I miss a factor of 2? Yeah, there's a 2 there. Sorry about that. That just comes from uh, expanding out the square. Or, since lambda is equal to uh, f divided by c, the wavelength of the photon that is scattered, lambda prime, differs from the wavelength of the incident photon by an amount which depends on the scattering angle. And in particular, it goes like 1 minus cosine theta. So I'd now like to spend uh, just a couple minutes discussing uh, the implications of this formula and what it means and why uh, we spent some time deriving it. Before I do so, let me just pause and make sure that everyone fo has followed that derivation. Okay. I just used the conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and our formulas for the energy and momentum of a photon in terms of its frequency or its wavelength. Yes. Question. What's theta? Theta is the angle. OK. So the basic picture that we have here is we start with an electron at rest and a photon that comes and hits it. And then after the process, the electron is going off in some direction and the photon's going off in some direction. They're not necessarily both going in the horizontal direction. So theta is the angle that the photon is going relative <coughs> to the horizontal direction. So the photon comes in and it's scattered off at some angle. Um, this would be the frame where the, this is not the, the center of mass frame. Um, this is the frame where the electron started out at rest. Good. Good question. Other questions? Um, I went through this derivation uh, a little bit fast because it's very, very similar to derivations that you've gone through uh, several times before in this class. But it's an important derivation. Because in particular, it gives you a very clear consequence of the particulate nature of light. So for example, when m is large, that implies that the, so the denominator here is uh, very large. And so that, uh, Lambda is very close to lambda prime. And uh, theta will be very close to pi over 2. Okay. So that, for example, this is just the intuitive uh, statement that if you have a very massive object here and you send something at it, it'll just bounce off in the back. Uh, let's say, did I get that right? Uh, Yeah, uh, theta um, will go like, I guess it's pi, isn't it? Sorry about that. Is it zero? Yeah. Well, either zero or pi. Okay. Right. Because, of course, from this formula, you can't tell. And so that, uh, in, in particular, what will actually happen is that the photon will be scattered back. And so that makes it very clear the particulate nature of light. Yes, there was a question. Oh, sure, sorry. Yeah, I went through this derivation a little bit quickly. 
Yeah, sorry, I went through it a little quickly. Um, it's not particular, yeah. So uh, feel free to go through it on your own time uh, if, uh, if, if every step wasn't completely clear. But the important point is that it leads to an expression for uh, the wavelength of light as a function of scattering angle so in particular lambda minus lambda prime as a function of theta so when theta is equal to zero lambda will be equal to lambda prime and then it will have some sort of uh, let's see, cosine behavior, I guess minus cosine behavior. So it'll look something like that. So if this is zero and that is pi, then this tells you the wavelength of light as a function of the scattering angle. And that's something that is relatively easy to measure. And so it was this initial uh, set of scattering experiments which really made it clear the particle nature of light. So in, for example, uh, the standard uh, Maxwell uh, electromagnetic wave description of light, you wouldn't see these scattering effects and you wouldn't see that the wavelength of light would depend on the angle on which it's scattered in this way. So this experiment was, I think, really uh, the first one which made it clear the particulate nature of, of light. And in particular, you can also see that there is a quantity here appearing on the right-hand side of this equation, h over mc, which has the dimensions of wavelength. And so you could think of it as a wavelength associated with the electron itself. Um, this is different from the wavelength that we discussed last class, the de Broglie wavelength. This is what's known as the Compton wavelength. So I'll write it down for you again. It's h over mc. This is a quantity with dimensions of wavelength, which is associated with the electron. So it depends only on the mass of the electron. And one should think of it as roughly the size of an electron at rest, as measured or as probed by the photon. The characteristic size of the change in wavelength of the photon as it scatters off the electron is the Compton wavelength of the electron times some factor that depends on the scattering angle. And this should be compared to the de Broglie wavelength, which is h over p. that we discussed last time, which is the characteristic wavelength of the electron when it behaves like a wave. You know, it's a bit confusing that there are really two different wavelengths associated with an electron. There's one which depends on its momentum and one which doesn't. And that really just underscores the fact that at this point, our theory of photons and electrons in quantum mechanics is not very well developed. And what we seek is a theory that will make sense of all of these various different pieces of experimental evidence and will allow us to determine 
precisely under what circumstances an electron behaves like a wave, what circumstances it behaves like a particle, and likewise for the photon. So I've introduced for you some of the basic um, experimental results that are necessary uh, to begin the development of quantum mechanics. Um, my goal over the um, next lecture or two is to begin a, uh, a, a bit of a gentle introduction uh, to uh, some of the uh, other experiments, such as uh, the Bohr quantization of the atom, before moving on to uh, a discussion of the formal structure of quantum mechanics and uh, what it means, how we describe states and observables in quantum mechanics. Maybe before I do so, let me see if there are questions. Uh, so if you rate P as MD, then the brother length of an electron moving at C would be the same as the atomic length? That's right. That's, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the statement that uh, as probed by the electron or by the photon is important here because that's really the origin of this C here in the equation. Good question. Yeah. Yes. Did I make a mistake? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Jesus Christ. Um, it's C over F. Oh, did I switch the primes then? You're right. I switched the primes. Lambda prime minus lambda. Thank you. I hope that I hope I got all the signs right. Let me see. Yeah, lambda prime minus lambda. Thank you. Yeah, you guys should correct me when I make stupid mistakes like this. Right. It has to be C over F. Why? Dimensional analysis. Okay. Lambda is a length. Frequency is one over time. Length over time is velocity. Okay. Uh, you can get a long way in this course just knowing dimensional analysis. Sorry. Uh, yes. So everyone knows why wavelength times frequency is equal to the velocity of propagation. That is just uh, what we mean by a propagating wave. Okay. Um, yeah. If you don't remember that, don't worry. We're going to have a brief reminder of exactly how waves, uh, waves work in 10 seconds. But before so, let me see if there are any questions. Good. So we have seen that the wave nature of light is something uh, that is very important. Uh, and the way, and that electrons under many circumstances behave like waves. And so what I would like to do now is give you a brief, uh, but, uh, uh, f a brief, um, but, um, well, well, a brief, uh, <laughs> reminder of the theory of waves, emphasizing a few basic properties of wave mechanics which are those properties uh, that we will need to remember when we generalize this to understand the theory of uh, photons and electrons in quantum mechanics. So before uh, talking about electrons as waves or photons as waves, let me just remind you of um, more elementary examples of waves. So a wave such as on a string such as a guitar string or water is described by an amplitude that depends on time. So for example, the height of uh, a wave, so if you have a wave on a string, then you could talk about the height of the string um, as a function of position and time. Uh, or if you're talking about water, you could talk about the height of the water wave as a function of the xy position that you're studying as a function of time. 
And the important point about these waves is that they solve the wave equation, which is a linear differential equation for the function h of t, that the second derivative of h with respect to x is proportional to the second derivative of h with respect to t. And the constant of proportionality by dimensional analysis has dimensions of t squared over x squared, so dimensions of 1 over velocity squared. And indeed, it turns out that that constant of proportionality in the wave equation tells you precisely the velocity of the propagating wave. So for example, the solutions to this wave equation tell you that h must be some function of x minus vt plus another function of x plus vt. So uh, for example, if you just look at what a function of x minus vt looks like as a function of time, then at a particular point in time, it might have some profile. And then at later time, it will have a profile that's shifted over to the left or to the right by an amount vt. And so that would describe some wave which is propagating with velocity v. I should mention um, this a bit more about this wave equation. So, so far I've just told you that it's some equation that the string satisfies or that a water wave will satisfy. Now, of course, if you're talking about a string that's some mechanical object and one could derive this wave equation from Newton's laws simply by coming up with some mechanical model of a string, you could think of it as a bunch of little particles that are uh, bound together in some way, or you could come up with a mechanical model of water um, and you could derive this wave equation. But right now, I'm not so interested in a particular mechanical model of whatever that medium is on which the wave propagates. I'm interested more in uh, the formal theory of waves and what properties it is of waves which allow them to exhibit interesting effects like interference and diffraction because it's those effects that we see for photons and electrons. And so it is those properties that we will need to keep in mind when we start discussing the theory of quantum mechanics. Are there any questions so far? I assume that you guys have seen uh, this wave equation and its solution as I've written it down here. Is that true? Is that a correct assumption? Is that an inc You have not. OK. Raise your hand if you have seen this before. Okay, so um, just as a, okay, so just as a uh, check, uh, what I would like you to do is I would like you to take this f of x minus vt and use the chain rule, plug it into this equation, and check that it's the solution of the differential equation. So um, indeed, on the right hand side, you see, using the chain rule, you get the second derivative of f. And on the right-hand side here, you also get the second derivative of f, but coming from the chain rule, so dh by dt is equal to df by dt times a factor of v coming from here, which is the derivative of the argument of f with respect to t. So the statement that this is just the solution is just the statement of the chain rule. And the fact that you, so if you just think about what this function of x minus vt looks like, when t is equal to 0, it's just some shape. And when t is equal to 1, it's just exactly the same shape, but shifted to uh, the right by some amount v. When t is equal to 2, it's shifted by an amount 2v, and so on, so on and so forth. So it describes some propagating wave solution. So 
There are certain special uh, solutions to the wave equation, which in the context of a wave propping on the string, we would call a uh, harmonic. And that's the solution where the wave h fluctuates in time sinusoidally and in particular where h will be uh, some constant a which is the amplitude of the wave times cosine uh, of omega the frequency of the wave times t minus x over v plus a constant theta, which is the phase of the wave. So again, it's a straightforward exercise to see that this is a solution of the wave equation. And indeed, this is exactly what you would think of when you think of a water wave that is propagating through water with some sort of uh, sinusoidal shape or of uh, the shape of a guitar string if you pluck it. And indeed, the waves that we will study in quantum mechanics, the waves that describe the electron and the photon, will have um, a very similar form to this wave that describes the propagation of uh, a water wave as a function of time. So there's a convenient um, trick that we use when we study these uh, harmonic solutions of the wave equation. So very frequently, we'll find it convenient not to talk about the position of the wave as a real number h, but rather as a complex number. So in particular, we could write h as the real part of a times e to the i theta times e to the i omega t minus x over v. So I remind you that the exponential of something e to the i phi is just cosine phi plus i sine phi. So that if you use, if you apply that to this expression, you see that this is uh, the real part of a times cosine of omega t minus x over v minus theta plus i times the sine of that same guy. So that the real part of this uh, complex wave is just the same wave cosine omega t minus x over v that we wrote down above. Yes? Uh, theta in the first one is, is a different What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I should really have written omega there. Yes. Thank you. Good. Um, why is it useful to use complex numbers to describe uh, solutions to the wave equation? Well, there are really two reasons. So the basic reason is that uh, sines and cosines are a pain to deal with. Okay? Exponentials are much easier to deal with. e to the a times e to the b is e to the a plus b. Okay? Cosine a times cosine b is something complicated I can never remember. Um, whereas e to the a times e to the b is e to the a plus b. That's really the basic reason. Um, but the, another reason why complex solutions to the wave equation are convenient to deal with is that since the wave equation is linear, We can freely uh, add and subtract solutions to the wave equation. So if H is a complex 
solution to the wave equation. Then so is its complex conjugate, okay, because the wave equation is real. So if h is the solution of the wave equation, so is its complex conjugate. So that implies so is the sum of h and its complex conjugate. And if you have a complex number and you take the sum of that number and its complex conjugate, that is just the real part of h okay, divided by a factor of 2. So the point is that because our wave equation is linear, meaning that you can take two solutions and add them together, and because it's real, meaning that if h is the solution, so is the complex conjugate of h, then you're free to just talk about complex solutions to the wave equation. And at the end of the day, you can always just take the real part of whatever solution you're studying, and you'll get a nice real solution. So whenever you have a wave equation which has this linearity property, then it'll make your life much easier if you just allow your solutions to be complex numbers rather than real numbers. And at the end of the day, you could always just take a real part and, and all of that complex business uh, will go away. Have you guys seen this before? The other reason why this is useful to do is that this allows us to combine the amplitude A and the period phi into one complex number, usually referred to as the complex amplitude. Um, I'll call it A sub C, which is A times E to the I theta. And so we have one less constant to deal with uh, in all of our equations. So this wave equation really has two important properties. Which make it interesting and easy to study and really which are responsible for the fact that it generalizes to the subject of uh, photons and electrons. So the first is what is known as linearity. So what is that? That is the statement that if h1 and h2 are solutions to the wave equation, and A and B are complex numbers, then the linear combination A H1 plus B H2 is a solution also to the wave equation. Um, so this, for example, is what allows for interference. For example, it means that if you have one wave, say, that looks like this, and another wave, which might be uh, the same thing here. I'll draw them on top of each other, but uh, displaced but out of phase ah, it's impossible to draw waves but out of phase uh, exactly out of phase then you can add them together and for example in this case they would interfere completely destructively and you would be left with nothing So here, you would have one wave plus minus the wave is equal to zero. Um, 
Or you could have two waves that are partially out of phase or have a different frequency and you would get something more complicated. And indeed, it is precisely this interference that is observed uh, in light, for example, uh, and also in the double slit experiment uh, for uh, all sorts of other types of matter. So really, by the double slit experiment, we see that, for example, electrons should be described by some sort of wave which obeys this linearity property. The second uh, important feature of the wave equation is that when we study waves subject to boundary conditions, which I'll explain in a second, then we obtain discrete frequency levels. So um, this is something that anyone who uh, has ever played a musical instrument, a stringed instru instrument at least, is familiar with. Actually, any instrument works on this principle, which is that, um, for example, you take a guitar string, then what is that? That is just a string that has waves propagating on it as usual, but it has fixed endpoints so that, for example, the height of the string off of uh, its equilibrium position is equal to zero when x is equal to zero and x is equal to l, where l would be the length of the guitar string. And then what that means is that the frequency omega takes some discrete value. If you've played the guitar, then you know about harmonics, um, which is the statement that if you pluck a guitar string, then you actually don't get one uh, frequency, but you actually get a combination of all possible frequencies, but they're all uh, proportional to some base, basic frequency. So if you want a picture of what this looks like, so here's your guitar string. Uh, here I've drawn the, its position before you pluck it, then after you pluck it, it will take one of a possible set of values. It will either look like that, or it will look like that. Oh, I can't draw a wave. That's supposed to be symmetric. Sorry about that. My artistic skills need something to be desired. Or it will look something like that. Again, I can't draw, or it will look something, or so on and so forth. Okay. Oh, and I missed one. So this was the one with one node, then we had two nodes, then there's one with three nodes. That looks like that, and so on and so forth. So this would be uh, the lowest harmonic, or the first harmonic. The solution with one node, uh, where by node I just mean uh, maximum of local maximum or local extremum 
of the uh, wave. Uh, this is the second harmonic, which has two nodes. This is the third harmonic with three nodes. Um, this is the fourth harmonic with four nodes, and so on and so forth. So for example, if you take a guitar string and you pluck it, you'll hear a note which is dominantly the lowest harmonic at the lowest frequency. But if you hold your finger at exactly the midway point between the two endpoints and then pluck it, you'll get a frequency which is exactly one octave higher um, because its frequency is twice that of the original node. And indeed, based on this, we can make a prediction If electrons are described by waves, then uh, if that means that the, if they are confined to some box or to some region, that means they are subject to some sort of boundary conditions, then they should have discrete frequencies. And in particular, they should have discrete energies. So we saw from our scattering double slit experiment that electrons should be regarded as waves. And waves have the fundamental property that if you put it in a finite region, like on a finite string, the energy levels will be discrete in some way. And so based on this, you would predict that if you have, if you have an electron and you put that electron in a box or a uh, more simply, if you took that electron and you bound it to a proton into an atom, then you would expect that the allowed energy levels and the allowed frequencies of the electron in that atom should take some discrete values. And starting next time, we'll make a prediction for those discrete values based on the wave picture of an electron. And we'll see that this prediction gives you precisely the Bohr model of the atom. So um, I apologize for going overtime for a few minutes, and I'll uh, see you on Monday. <laughs>